And then if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, I'm going to invite you to turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. We're only going to look at three verses, 3 through 6. Uh, if you don't have a Bible or electronic devices with a Bible on it, no worries. Uh, the scriptures are going to come up on what I call the Sky Bible. And so there's going to be some scriptures that appear in case you're new to our church. Um, then you can, you can read along and you can follow along as well. And so this morning is just a standalone message. In a few moments at the close, we're going to take communion together. And so I think it's, it's appropriate to talk about this topic. It's appropriate to talk about this issue of, of forgiveness of sin. The title of this message is, It's a Dirty Job. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, right? Uh, maybe you've heard that slogan. Maybe you've heard that saying, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do that. We all have those chores around the house, right, uh, that would say, you know what, it's a dirty job, but, but somebody's got to do it. Um, it. I'm reminded of this saying. In fact, is I learned this saying when I, was in, when, I was a, when I graduated from high school before I went to college. Uh, my dad was a, a plant manager at a gas plant outside of Bay City, Texas, in, in a place called Wharton, Texas. And, uh, and so he was a gas plant manager. <coughs> he was worried that I would get into trouble uh, in, in the summer without anything to do before I went to college. And he also wanted me to have an unbelievable work, e work ethic and know what it means to earn a day's living. So as a result of that, he got me a job at the gas plant where he was managing with a construction company. And it was their job to, like, dismantle portions of the gas plant. I, I started that day, he took me over to the, the foreman, and he looked at the foreman, and he said, this is my son, but if you treat him like the boss's son, I will fire you. And so I want him to learn how, I want him to learn what it means to work, what it means to earn an honest day's living, so I need you to work him hard. And so that just simply meant that they treated me like the worst employee ever. And so they developed this saying on the job site that, well, it's a dirty job, but Charlie's going to do it. And so, I, I mean, they just hammered that all. Fact is, uh, we had this. Now, if you were from Texas, you're going to know exactly what this is, but I'll have to explain it because most of you aren't from the promised land. And so uh, <laughs> you're foreigners. And so uh, that's why I can say stuff like that because I'm going to talk about forgiveness in a second. And so we had to dismantle this. It was called a scrubber. And a scrubber is just like this big tank. It's this big cylinder thing that, that's vertical and goes high up, and it's metal. And then in it, it has all these baffles. And so what happens when the oil, and say it like you guys, not like Texan, oil. And so, and so this oil, when the oil would come in from the, from the oil derricks, uh, it would go first to a scrubber, and it would go in the top. And it would like work its way down over these metal baffles, and then the baffles would separate out the water and the, and the gases and, and some other in, impurities. And actually, it's scrubbing, that's where the word comes from, it's scrubbing the oil, purifying the oil, uh, so it can go into the refining process. So they had to dismantle this, and they needed somebody to go into the little manhole cover in the side. They needed to shove someone in there with a blowtorch and cut out the metal baffles. And you know what it was? Dirty job, but Charlie's going to do it. And so they opened it up, and they shoved me in with a, uh, with a, with a blowtorch, and, they, and then, then a fire extinguisher says, you're going to need this. And so, <laughs> and I stayed in there. And so that was back in the days when we thought wearing a hazmat suit or like a respirator, that's a uh, re respirator. I don't even know where that word came from. <laughs> it's probably chemical exposure. Now you know what's wrong. Now you know what's wrong with me. And so they'd shove us in with a hazmat suit and a respirator, and, uh, because, and, they, and we didn't use those in those days because we thought, you know what, those things are for sissies, right? And it's not going to hurt you smelling all these chemicals, and now you, now you see what happens. And so, uh, and, so, and, I, and so I spent my summer working with this construction company and hearing them say, it's a dirty job, but Charlie's going to do it. In life journaling, we've been journaling through our way through, a fee, uh, for, for, through uh, Hebrews, and we came to this passage, and I thought about this this last week. And Hebrew, uh, Hebrews, uh, I am messed up. It, <laughs> Hebrews 1.3, it says this. In making purification for our sins, talking about Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, Jesus is the one that purified us of our sin. It's a dirty job, but only Jesus could do it. It is a dirty job purifying us of our sins. But only Jesus could do it. He was the only one that lived a sin, sinless life. He was the only one that lived a perfect life. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The scripture says this. Once he purified us of our sins, dirty job. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. 
Only Jesus could do that, right? Now listen, let me tell you something. I'm a burden preacher. In other words, I don't, I don't pick hot, hot topics and I'm mad about this or angry about this. I'm not, I don't preach against stuff. You guys know me. You know that it's not my ministry. My ministry, the way I describe myself, and it's unique. I know that. I understand that. I am a burden preacher. In other words, God gives me a burden for you. He gives me a burden for the, a congregation. And so I, I sit and I study scripture. I walk through scripture. And my job on the weekends is to try to, try to lift a burden off of you, try to help you understand something about scripture in other words that just speaks to you it's not just information it's something that we can like like revelation that like changes us and so I don't always tell you my burden for a series or my burden for a sermon but I think it's appropriate this weekend here's my burden based on conversations I've had with Christians in our church outside of our church <coughs> there's a lot of believers a good amount of believers that have been forgiven of a sin, of an action in their past, something they've done, something they've said. God has forgiven them. They have walked through the steps of repentance. That is not, that is not who you are anymore. You haven't, you haven't done that. You've changed. You've totally changed. But for some reason, you still carry the guilt. You still carry the weight and for some reason, you still do not feel like you're totally and completely forgiven. And you may know it intellectually. When we gather and we get together that Christ died for our sins, he forgave us of our sins. But there's that sin, there's that action. There. And listen, I've, I've been there, I've, I've lived that, so I, I know. And my burden this morning is for you to understand that, guess what? Purification of your sins, it was a dirty job, only Jesus could do it. And then we have to come to the place to where we receive that, to where we understand that. That because of his sacrifice, because of his death on the cross, it's called God's grace. And you have to come to this place, and you may have repented and asked for forgiveness and be a believer. That may not who you, be who you are. And God has forgiven you, and he's given you that grace. But I'm asking you, have you received it? Have you accepted it? Do you know? And it's one thing for someone to give you a gift, right? Like on a birthday or, or, or Christmas. And it's one thing for someone to give you the gift, but have you opened it and have you received this gift of grace? The freest people I know in the world are those who submit most fully to the authority of Christ in the Scriptures. And God, is a, He's a source of everything, which means, which means everything else is a resource. The Bible describes like, the, like freedom is the presence of someone, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says. Now the, spirit of the, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When God's spirit gets into the deepest, darkest places of your life, you'll have freedom. And you can live life out of freedom and not live life out of guilt and bondage and feeling like i got to work off my sins. Truth is more than just facts and, and doctrine. I mean, uh, and what we know and how we know it. The scripture says that truth is a person and in, in his name is Jesus Christ. The Pharisees, they, they knew the, ver the Bible very well. But how they knew it and how they applied it brought death not only to themselves but to others. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And so God's word does not change our circumstances. It changes us. Changes the way we look at them. And when, listen, when we get him in the dark places of our lives, then we begin to change. Man, my burden, I'm just telling you. I mean, we're going to take my burden for you. If there is a sin in your past, and you're a believer and you've asked for forgiveness and you have repented of change of mind that leads to a change of action, and you're still beating yourself up over that, you're still carrying a lot of guilt over that, and you're rehearsing that over and over and over in your mind, my burden for you this morning is that you would know that you are totally and completely forgiven. You are deeply loved in him. Ephesians says this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. <coughs> says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, 
that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory is grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You know what that's telling us? That's telling us you're the object of his grace. And when you've met the condition of his grace, that you are totally and completely forgiven. Now, the scripture teaches us, and we're going to read in a few minutes, that grace was never intended to be a license for sin. It is the goodness of God that gets my attention, not the judgment of God, right? Romans tells us it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance, that brings us to him. And so we've learned in the Jonah series, right, five weeks in Jonah, that his grace just keeps chasing us, it keeps coming, it's continual, it's pursuing us, and and it, and it came out of a problem in Jonah's life, right? And so here's, a, here's an unbelievable prom, uh, principle in the Old Testament that every miracle in the Old Testament started with a problem. Every miracle in the Old Testament started with a problem. So if you're here this morning and, and you have a problem, good news. God has set you up for a miracle. God has set you up. I mean, isn't that what happened to the, the team in Haiti? They have a problem. And there are some things that God has done that we didn't even have time to talk about this morning in the announcement of providing for them. Listen, let me tell you something. God is not looking for ways to quit blessing you. He is looking at ways to keep blessing you. And God does not treat you as your sins deserve. God does not treat you that way. He does not treat you as a second-class citizen. When you're in Christ, you're a, you're a son or you're a daughter of his. So just a couple of things with a few uh, sub-points about, <coughs> about this issue of grace, about this issue of forgiveness. The first one is this. God's grace forgives us completely. God's grace forgives us completely. Not partially, not halfway, not, not you got to work it off. We'll just see how, how long you can be good. We'll see how long you can change. No, the scripture says God's grace forgives us completely. Now listen, sometimes perfection, right? Because that's what we're talking about. Sometimes perfection is hard for us to understand, right? Especially depending on how you, you were raised. I, sometimes it's hard for me and, uh, to comprehend that God not only forgives and forgets. Now, the doctrine of justification or being justified. Uh, one man once said ju being justified is simply this. The definition of this, it, the definition of that is simply just as if I'd never sinned. That you're in this place of complete and total forgiveness. But the problem is, right, we know we've sinned. The problem is we've known what we've said. We, we know what we've done. Uh, verse 6 in Ephesians 1 says, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so I can believe that. I can read that. I can depend on that. I can, I can, I can lean on it. And I can understand that I'm accepted into his family and I'm an object of his grace but the real question is, how does he forgive sin? How, how do I put flesh to that? How does he forgive sin? Here, here's a few things. Uh, one is, is he distance our sin from us? Did he distance our sin from us? One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is Psalms 103.12, and it says this, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. In other words, I believe this morning, if we did nothing but to understand that one verse, we meditated on that verse, we thought about that war verse, we prayed that verse, we made that, we made that very personal, and we understood that he takes our sins as far as the east is from the west. In other words, that he distances us, distance our sins from us. It's his place of perfection, but that, that's hard to understand, right? Because many people have been taught since childhood that, you know what, you're just, you're just not good enough. Many people have been taught, you know what, you're, 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 you're imperfect, you're inadequate, that no matter, no matter how hard you work, no matter what you achieve, no matter what you do, you just kind of fall short. You just kind of miss the mark. If we couldn't satisfy a mom or a dad or, or we couldn't satisfy an authority figure in our life, whether it's a teacher, a coach, a friend, um, a boss, a supervisor, to where all of a sudden we, we got this idea that, you know what, we just, we're just never good enough. We're never perfect enough. And listen, if we're not careful, we'll transfer that to God. And we'll say, you know what? I can never satisfy him. I can never be perfect enough. But yet, God's word says, God's grace, you're the object of his grace, that God's grace distances us from our sin. Puts us in a place of holiness. Puts us in a place of righteousness as if we had never sinned ever again. In other words, God's, God's word tells us this. He takes our sins and moves our sins far away from us and far away from him. 
fact is there's a scripture that simply says that he removed our transgressions from us. I mean, God gives the, the Jewish people an unbelievable word picture when he says, I distance your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. And it's a word picture, and it means a lot to them. Uh, we can comprehend distance, right? We can comprehend how far something is, whether it's, whether it's inches, feet, miles. Uh, we can comprehend great distances like the distance from the earth to the moon and distance from the earth to galaxies. And so God was trying to help them with this verse understand that God wants you to know that your sins are far away from him and far away from you when you meet the condi conditions of grace. But there's some people that still struggle with this, and they, man, they go back in their memories and their life, and they continue to like playing the same old, old tapes of failures. And for your younger generation, it's playing the same old podcast, right, or the same old YouTube clip. Of some of your failures, some of your sins, some of the things you've said or you've done, and for whatever reason you don't feel forgiven, you're living under this guilt, and, and somehow you feel like, I don't please God, and I'm just not good enough. So when, when God read this scripture, when God said this scripture, that God separates your sins as far as the east is from the west, what did he mean by that? There's a, there's a biblical, I just want to teach you something, I don't want to get too technical, I just want to teach you something. In, there's, in biblical hermeneutics, and the word hermeneutics is just a fancy theological word that simply means this, the interpretation of Scripture. fact is you do this every day and you don't even realize it. When you get an email, when you read the newspaper, when you read a book, when you read a magazine article, uh, you are using hermeneutics to wait, read an email, understand it, and then apply it to your life. There, there's rules for that, right? And the same thing is interpreting Scripture. One of the main principles of biblical hermeneutics is this. The scripture cannot mean something different to us than it meant to the original hearers. I mean, and so you got to go back in time. you got to go back in their culture. You first have to understand what that scripture meant to them. You get the principle out, and you bring it into our time. That's, that's simply what I do on the weekends. And so, so when, 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 when God said, he's taken your sins as far as the east is from the west, um, the Jew understood that. Now listen, this is before enlightenment, uh, the age of enlightenment. They didn't even know the earth was round at this point. Uh, they didn't have a frame of reference. And so now you got to understand, so what did they think about? If, you, if you've ever gone to Israel, uh, I, I took a group uh, a, no <coughs> a number of years ago to Israel, and I'm, we're looking at and thinking about taking another group in, in 2019 uh, to, uh, to the Holy Land. And so one of the places that we visited was, was the temple, and that's where the, the Jew would worship. And so when the Jew would come in there, and, and when the Jew would come in there, then they would normally go to the altar of sacrifice, which is placed on the, the, the farthest eastern side of the temple. And so that's where they'd make the sacrifice for their sins, whether it's a blood sacrifice, whatever. And so that was, the east, eastern, uh, that was on the eastern side, it was the altar of sacrifice. Then once a year, the high priest, uh, the day of atonement is what it's called. The high priest would come in and with all the Jewish people watching, would go over to the east side of the temple and take the, the blood from the, from the altar of sacrifice. And it was a, it was, it was a long distance. And he'd walk slowly over to where? To the west side, to the holy of holies, the presence of God. And he would offer it there. And so it was a picture that when we take our sins to God, that he's the one that purifies us. He's the one that cleanses us. When God gets into the deepest, darkest places of our life, there's forgiveness and there's freedom. So when the Jewish person, when the original hearers heard that, they got it. They understood. It is the distance between the east and the west. It is a distance between my sins being taken to the presence of God where he forgives and he, he removes I mean, look, look at it in the total context, Psalm 103.10. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Listen, if you're carrying guilt over something that you've done, God is not, and you've been forgiven, God is not trying to get even with you. When you have a flat, when you run out of gas, when the refrigerator breaks down, it is not because God is trying to get even with you and paying you back for something that you've done. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast to love towards those who fear him. We are the object of his grace. As far as, now we understand it, as far as the east is from the west. 
So far does he remove our transgressions from us. Because of the grace of God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So why do we play those old tapes? Why are we haunted by yesterday's failures, controlled by them, obsessed by them and, and finding them and digging them up? Can I tell you what we're doing when we, when we do that? We're saying, God, I know what your word says, but this is what I say. God, I know you say you, you forgive me of my sins, you remember them no more, but God, this is what I say. I'm telling you, the freest people I know in the world are those who submit most fully to the authority of Christ in Scripture. Here, here's another one. Um, he d- disposes of our sins. In the, in the Old Testament, go back to that again, they had a very little concept of, of, of distance in, in space and the world. In fact, is it, was, it was hard for them to understand. And so in ancient times, they were always trying to determine the depths of the sea. And they believed you couldn't determine the depths of the sea. They didn't have a, lo- a long enough rock, uh, well, a rock and a rope that they could throw into the ocean to where they'd touch the bottom. So they basically believed there was no bottom to, to, to the ocean. You could not comprehend that. And then watch, watch this, how he says he disposes. I mean, he's talked in language that they would understand and that we would understand. Micah seven nineteen, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities under, underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He gave them a word picture. He says, you, you want to know where your, your sins are? bottom of the sea. They're like, well, we we can't find that. I mean, we can't even reach that. He said, exactly. Exactly. I've not only distanced you from your sins, I've disposed of your sins. you, you You can never touch them again. You will never meet your sins again when they've been forgiven. It's, it's interesting to me about the bottom of the ocean. Remember the Malaysia jetliner that, that crashed, the passenger jet that crashed into the ocean? And with all the scientific discoveries and the equipment that we have and the technology that we have, they couldn't even find a plane at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and and someone's <coughs> someone said the ocean is just too deep and too vast uh, for us to find that jetliner. In fact, as one scientist said, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of the ocean. And in God's grace, he loves and moves in our life in such a way that he disposes of our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's because of of his grace that he totally and completely forgives us. When you're, man, I'm telling you, when you're in Christ and you've met the conditions of grace, you are perfect and complete and lacking nothing. You are deeply loved in him. Man, I've, I've lived this. I have... I have gone through periods of my life and beaten myself up black and blue and lived the, con- the Christian life out of bondage instead of freedom over a sin that I've been totally forgiven of. Over a sin, I, I just wasted so much emotional energy. Here, here's another one. He deletes our sin. This may be one of my favorite ones. Uh, Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And then watch this. Huge promise. I will remember them no more. Only God can do that. I mean, he has the power to remember. He chooses not to. And so you ask yourself the question, well, can man delete? Absolutely. I mean, we forget stuff, right? I got, <coughs> I got thousands of pictures on my phone. And uh, I am known in my family for taking random pictures. Uh, my family loves to scroll through my pictures because I tell you what, you do something out in public, I, random, I will take a picture of you and not feel bad about it. I have been known to, I've been known to circle around the block. I've been known to change directions. I have been known, I have random, I'm telling you, I have some random pictures. Uh, Saturday night, 5 o'clock, uh, I shared about one of them and I realized, oh, TMI, that was way too much information. And so people just thought, man, you're weird. But I'm, I'm just telling you. If I see something random happen, I'm taking pictures and I'm texting it out to my, to my family. And so they love, to, they love to scroll through my phone and say, I can't believe, I can't believe you got a picture of this. And I said, well, it, it happened. I mean, here it is. And so, so, uh, so from time to time, I go through my phone, maybe like you do, and I got to call out some of my pictures, right? 
Because I got thousands of them, much like you. And there's, there's times that I'm scrolling through pictures, and I even forgot we did that, right? It's like, oh, that's new news to me. I mean, I'm getting to that age where I forget things. And so, uh, so I, you know, plus I've been in a scrubber. And so, uh, <laughs> and so I'll go through my phone, and I'll decide, you know what, deleting these pictures out, and I click them, and then maybe your phone is, is like mine. Um, <coughs> I go delete, you know, you hit the trash can deal, and then what comes up? A warning message. And says, you're going to delete every picture off of every one of your devices. You'll never see it again as long as you live. Are you sure? Message, right? Isn't it a good feeling to hit that? Bam! Don't you wish there was an app like that for your sins? Don't you wish there's an app like that? That when you commit that sin and you meet the conditions of grace and forgiveness, it's been forgiven, it's been disposed of, it's been distanced from you, it's been deleted. But you hit it, it's like gone. I do. You know how we do that? We, we do that by faith. Do that by spending time in his word. Understanding. See, the crummy thing is, God says, I will remember your sins no more. And oftentimes, we're the ones that remember them. Or we have someone in our life that continually remembers us, remembers them, and reminds us of them. Romans said this, Paul said this in the book of Romans. He said, now that the law came in to increase the trespass, but we, where sin increased, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whatever the sin, whatever the habit, whatever the need, whatever the failure, whatever the problem, whatever the transgression, his grace is more. John said, John 1.16 says, from the fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And so that phrase in the, in the New Testament is probably one of my favorite phrases, grace upon grace. You know what that simply means? Grace piled up on grace. Grace piled up on grace. Grace is ever, everlasting. Grace is continual. It's grace upon grace. Um, Saturday, we, we cleaned the garage and, and, uh, and then got to those point, it was, a, it was a dirty job, so Charlie had to do it. And uh, maybe we're like you, but we had some items <coughs> that we, we needed to get rid of and that the, the, the weekly trash service isn't going to haul it away. So I loaded up my truck and I went to the, the Pueblo landfill, which I do like once a year. And, you know, I pull out up, up out there and it's like dusty and it's stinky and, you know, it's just, you know, and so I pull up and the bulldozer guy's there. He weighs me on, tells me where to back up my truck. So I back up my truck. You know, and I'm like throwing stuff out. And so if you're like me, I mean, that's just a great feeling. And so I'm just tossing stuff and some of Karen's stuff. And, and so I'm just, <laughs> so I, I'm just tossing stuff overboard. And, um, and then I, I get in my truck, close the tailgate, and I'm, I'm about ready to get into my truck. And all of a sudden, the bulldozer guy comes in, right, even before I left. And, and, and he's just covering it up, dirt after dirt after dirt to where I, I no longer could see the, the junk and the stuff of my past. All of a sudden, it, it just like looked like a dirt field. That's grace upon grace. That's forgiveness. To where you could no longer see it ever again. Last thing is this, is God forgives sin freely. Romans 3.23 says, <coughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. So there you see that word justified, doctrine of justification, just as if I'd never sinned. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation uh, by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has, who has faith in Jesus Christ. So just so we're tracking this morning, it's, this is known as grace. His grace is 
Man, his grace is free, but it cost him everything. There's a difference between the cost of grace and the condition of grace. Though it cost you nothing, it cost God everything. It cost him his son. And the condition of grace is simply this, to come to the place in your life where you agree with God that that was wrong, that I sinned, I blew it, I agree with you that it was wrong, and as a result of that, I repent, change of mind that leads to a change of direction. And Scripture says when we do that, we're totally forgiven. It's a condition of grace. It's a condition of forgiveness. The good news is, whatever you've done, whether it haunts you, keeps you up at night, keeps you from living life in freedom, but you live life in bondage. When you come to the point and you know that you know that you know that you've been forgiven, it changes everything. And my concern, my burden, is that there are some that they have repented met the conditions of grace. It was something that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it still haunts them, still haunts you. And my prayer for you this morning, that if that is you, that you release that to him this morning. 